Um, in the 1860s, uh, my great grandfather Michael uh, moved to the northeast from Ireland, uh, and he, he came to work uh, in the coal mines of, of Southwest Durham. Michael couldn't uh, read or write, uh, and I know this because I've got his wedding uh, certificate that, that is signed at the bottom with a, with a cross. Five generations later, Michael's great granddaughter. Uh, studied English and left Oxford University with a degree in English. And I'm fascinated by that journey. How do you get from, uh, you know, how do you make that, that, that link between complete illiteracy, unable to write your own name, to a degree in English from one of the most competitive universities um, in the world? Something must have happened along the way. And of course, what happened was education. And that's education in Catholic schools. That journey uh, takes many twists and turns. Uh, and sometimes uh, things come along and knock you sideways that you weren't expecting. One of those uh, twists came in September 1958, when a young man made a decision. And this young man was a soldier. And he was in Newcastle at the time, and he needed to get, to get back to his barracks at, uh, at Catholic Garrison. And he was on a motorbike and the lights on his motorbike weren't working, but he decided to make the journey anyway. So he rode from Newcastle down the route of the old A1, and he got as far as Rushy Ford, not too far away from here. And he arrived at Rushy Ford at precisely the time my father was crossing the road in order to catch a bus at the other time. They didn't see each other, of course they wouldn't, he had no lights, and there was a collision and my father was killed uh, as a result of that. Whatever journey my life was going to take, whatever plans people had made for me, um, changed on that night. And of course, everybody has got an event like that in their lives. And those of you that were here last year will remember Dan Robinson uh, memorably, dis memorably describing the night the, of his father's death and how that changed um, his life. I was three at the time, uh, and my sister Julia was six months and my mother was left uh, to bring the two of us up um, on her own. She was sustained by two things in particular, I think. A large family network, and I mean a large family network. For example, I have 49 first cousins. Um, and, and she has had a, a deep faith. We lived in the new town of Newton Aycliffe, uh, which new town populated mainly by people who left the, the mining villages uh, to, to work in the, the factories that had been built following the Second World War. When I, where I grew up, we grew up a hundred yards away from a house that we called the doctor's house. It was a white house. And you know, occasionally we'd sneak in, in there for the ball, that, you know, football had gone over the wall or something. Occasionally we would sneak in the doctor's house to retrieve the ball or, or whatever. Didn't think anything of it until I later discovered in later life, this was the, the house belonging to William Beveridge. William Beveridge, the founder of the welfare state and one of the uh, new town commissioners. Uh, and I just thought, you know, it's one of those unusual twists of fate, isn't it? That, that years later, I was teaching about William Beveridge, the students in this school, uh, and its house had been a hundred yards um, from where I grew up. In those early days in Newton Aircliffe, there, were, there was no Catholic school and there was no Catholic church. My first uh, memory of mass was in a Nissan hut, actually called the Beveridge Hall. Um, and the majority of Catholics in Newton Aycliffe, the Catholic students, went to the county schools um, because clearly that, that was all that was available. Some parents, including my mother, took the decision, however, to send us to Catholic schools in, in nearby towns. And the decision was made for me that I would attend a uh, school in Darlington. So my first school, therefore, was St. Augustine School in Darlington. And I can vividly remember my first day there. We, um, my mother came with me, we went to, to, to the bus, which was, we, the bus picked us up in a car park in the Iron Horse pub in Newton Hickley, if it's still there, and uh, the car park, not the bus, obviously. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and it took, took us to the school, and day one I remember, I remember, you know, the, the events of some of, some of that first day, um, clearly. And the, the walk from our house was about a mile and a half. Day two, I walked on my own. And this is, you know, a mile and a half across roads in the winter, dark mornings, dark nights. And in later years, I, th I thought, oh, this is, 
you know, Mother, what on earth were you thinking of? And she said, well, that's what everybody did then. You know, a five-year-old at those times, you, 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 you did wonder about it and nobody thought anything um, of it. Uh, these days, of course, you'd report somebody for, 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 for doing that. But, you know, in those days, nobody ever thought anything of it. Uh, however, my mother did actually have a brush uh, with social services in my... I was two years at St. Augustine's, in my two years at St. Augustine's, because on one particular day, she was summoned to meet the head teacher. And the head teacher was a, was, was a nun, and my mother went to the office, and sitting alongside uh, um, the head teacher was um, somebody who introduced herself as a representative of, Dur of Durham County Council Social Services. My mother, sat, my mother sat down. She had no idea what this was about. You know, was it a good thing, a bad thing? No idea. And the head pushed a sheet of paper across the desk um, to my mother, and he said, um, "Can you explain this, please?" Mother looked at it. She recognised my writing. She saw that it was a story that I'd, I'd, I'd clearly written, and she read it. And in this story, I'd made reference to 12 different public houses. <laughs> now, my mother didn't drink. She didn't go to public houses, and I'd never been to a public house. And in those days, of course, children didn't go anywhere near public houses. Uh, and the implication was clear. They thought my mother had been going around public houses uh, with me in tour. Um, and it was a bit awkward um, uh, for my mother um, because she, you know, she's just completely at a loss to explain it. Then she noticed something, and what she realised was these these twelve public houses were actually the twelve public houses that the, that the bus from Newton Aylesford to Darlington passed each day and cleared what I'd been doing, been looking out the window, travelling on a bus was quite exciting, of course, at the time I didn't have a car or anything like that. And I'd learned these, these names of these, uh, these 12 public houses and I'd written them in the correct sequence on the journey and I'd made a story out of it. And my mother uh, has also pointed out in life that um, I spelt them all correctly as well, which, is, <laughs> which I, was, I was very pleased about. When she was able to explain this uh, to, to the head in Durham County Social Services, the meeting got slightly less tense and, uh, and, and it was all sorted out. So sometimes today, in today we think that child protection is something new. Well, of course, it isn't necessarily new. It's something that's been going on um, a long time. Uh, and that, I think, is pretty much uh, the beginning of my um, fascination with licensed premises that has continued <laughs> pretty much um, to this day. My memories of St. Augustine's, it was, it was an old Victorian building uh, where the, the windows were high up so you couldn't see out of them. That was deliberately done. Um, wooden desk with slates on that you could write on. We did have paper, but the slates were there um, if you ever needed them. Uh, and, a, and a big fire in the classroom, and the caretaker would come in and, and uh, put coal on the fire during the course of the lessons and so forth. Uh, and I have a vivid memory of, of, of music at the time, um, of, of singing the, the big ship sails over the alley alley, or and I remember booming this out the top of my voice and marvelling at the way it echoed through the, uh, the, the roofs of this old Victorian um, building. Uh, 1962, uh, after two years at St. Augustine's, Newton Aycliffe got its first Catholic school, and very so, so I, I left the bus and, uh, and I went to St. Mary's uh, School in Newton Aycliffe, and very shortly afterwards made my first communion. Um, you probably, probably can't say that very well, but if you're looking for me, the clue is, whenever I was at school, I was always the shortest boy uh, in the class. Um, I might add, I was always the shortest uh, member of staff at uh, Mars, but I was very happy when Danny Curry joined the staff, because he gave me some competition. Um, the, uh, the head teacher of, uh, of St. Mary's, uh, Newton Aycliffe, was, was also a nun, and she was a member of an order of nuns called the Sisters of the Cross and Passion, and she wore a badge that said, Cross and Passion. Well, I didn't realise this was an order of nuns. I thought this was a description of her character. <laughs> you know, and it fitted her perfectly, to be honest. And uh, this is, the, you know, the, the 1960s, Feminism just beginning, and she, you know, 
I don't know if, I don't ever remember nuns being in the forefront of the women's liberation movement, but you know, uh, she was thereabouts, and, uh, and she was a very formidable and feisty character. Um, but one day, I and my friends decided that we wanted to ambush her with something, and we waited for our time, and we waited for the day, because she used to join us at different tables at Edward's time, and waited for the day she joined us at the table, and she said, hello boys, how are things, right? And this was our moment that we planned for, right? At that point, all my friends sitting around the table suddenly became absolutely fascinated by what was on their dinner plate. You know, and heads down, studied that and wouldn't look up, and I was the only one that was giving her eye contact. So it left to me to say what we'd planned to say, and, and it was this. Sister, um, we think, we, we think we need a male teacher in this school. Was the wrong thing to say. <laughs> she pointed at me, and because she wasn't looking at anybody else, she pointed at me and said, can you tell me one thing that a man can do that a woman can't? Looked around for some support and they were still fascinated by their parents. So I said, well, if we had a, a man teacher, we'd have a football team. Blood rubbish, she dismissed that and went away. Okay. Next morning we had an assembly. And the assembly said, right boys and girls, um, I've made a decision, we're going to have a football team. And the practice, she gave the details of when the practice was going to be, what kit you needed, etc, etc. And uh, so we had this practice, uh, this trial for the football team, as it was. And we were wondering who the coach was going to be yet, and sure enough it was Sister Siobhan, uh, who came out in, you know, full, full regalia, uh, habit touching the floor, etc. The only concession she made was she had a whistle. Um, <laughs> And she was brilliant. You know, and she picked the team and she, she decided upon the tactic. She took me to one side and said, right, Michael, I want you to be the Bobby Charlton of this team. <laughs> I'd have preferred Georgie Best, to be honest. But Bobby Charlton was pretty good. And, uh, and I was amazed by her knowledge of, uh, of football. And, you know, if, I think I'd possibly start to fall in love with uh, this, this, this nun who, who was such a, a tactical genius when it came to football. Uh, and we had our, we had, you know, we ended the league and we had our first proper game against Sugar Hill uh, Junior School, Newton Aycliffe, a great, great name at Sugar Hill. But, uh, uh, and she said, right, uh, we've, we've, I've ordered the football uh, strip, we're going to play in, in Celtic shirts. Fine, that was good, pretty predictable, you know, but uh, that was fine. Uh, and, and on the day of the first game, she brought this big box uh, to the team meeting and whatever, and said, here's the shirts, boys. And she lifted them out. And she said, there you go, boys, just like Celtic. Well, <laughs> they were green and white. But if you know anything about Celtic, Celtic shirts are in hoops and those are stripes. And she was just like Celtic, boys. And I looked around, nobody seemed to think anything when he was about this. And then I realised she didn't know the first thing about football. It had all been an act. And I didn't think any less of it. In fact, I respected her more for that, and I kept quiet about this. I said, yeah, surely, certainly great. Um, and what was obvious to me was that, uh, you know, impressive that she'd listened to us, hadn't initially uh, agreed with us, but then thought about it, hadn't got anybody else to do anything about it, and so she decided that she would do something um, about herself. And that was the football team. Um, I'm told I don't look any different now, so you can probably pick me out there. Um, there are certain people in this room who could tell you what position I played by looking at that, um, at that uh, photograph, and I'm sure Peter Webster would tell you it was inside left, and I was number 10. Um, and you know, when, when I've, I've, I've sometimes uh, told students about this, and they ask me what position did you play, so I said inside left, and I said, what? Because of course that position didn't really exist anymore. But I'm for, I'll be forever grateful to Sister Yvonne. Um, if I say she saved my life, well, I'd probably put it a bit strongly, but I always had a fascination uh, and, and passion for football. As a young boy, I probably didn't read very much, but what I did read voraciously, football programmes, newspaper articles about football, Charles Buchan's Football Monthly, anything I'd get my hand on football, I read, and I think that gave me um, a facility for English language and, and, and words that you know stood me in reasonable stead for the rest of my life. 
Um, and it also taught me something, I think, as a teacher, the power of that chance conversation. Sisters, you've all sitting down with us, how is it going? So throughout my career at English Marcus, I had my lunch in the dining hall, and I pretty much tried every day to, to say to somebody, how is it going? And sometimes that sparked off a conversation that you know, took you places that you weren't really expecting. After my time at, uh, at um, St. Mary's um, uh, in Newton Aycliffe, uh, in those times uh, there were the grammar schools or secondary schools and, and there was a parting of the way of students. There, were, there was no 11 plus exam, but it was all done on head teacher recommendation. And uh, some of the girls went to the Immaculate Conception School in Darlington, some of the boys went to St. Mary's Grammar School in Darlington, and others went to St. John's in Bishop Auckland. Um, I have vivid memories of, of the Monday morning, because we got the letters on the Saturday telling us which school we were going to go to. And I have vivid uh, memories of, of the Monday morning. And the first question anybody asked you was, did you pass? And if you didn't pass, you failed. And 20% of us passed, 80% of us failed. And these, these are 11, 11 year olds learning a very hard lesson um, um, about life. Um, so I went to St. Mary's School. Uh, secondary school uh, in Darling, the school for boys, um, and that's the, uh, the photograph taken of uh, of us um, for in the first at the beginning of uh, second year year eight in uh, in modern money. I'm still the smallest in the class. There's a different set of boys, but I'm still the smallest in the class. Uh, and, um, if you, as you're looking, you're top right in the corner there, um, and that's me. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to share with you uh, is a story of something that happened to us in that particular year, um, in, in 1968. Um, and it was a story uh, that made the front pages of, of the newspapers. Uh, and the headline there says, Midnight at Midday. And there was one particular day when uh, the sky turned black. And I can see Peter Webster's nodding there, so you can clearly remember that one. Uh, it was an, uh, uh, an amazing phenomenon. Hadn't been predicted, wasn't expected, and the sky turned black and it suddenly became midnight. And this was at 20 to 12 on the morning, it suddenly became midnight. Nobody knew what was happening. And I, I was in the classroom, I was having a history lesson at the time, as it happens. Uh, and we could hear from the rest of the school uh, screams. We could hear people crying. We later discovered that some teachers had told the children to get under the desks. Um, some, some people thought it was the end of the world. Um, and this is only a couple of years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, so some people thought this was the, you know, the beginning of a nuclear war or something. People just didn't know um, what was happening. Uh, the sky honestly went black, never seen anything like it uh, uh, in my life since. Uh, and it was followed by um, an amazing thunder, thunderstorm when in my memory, uh, in the memory of others, uh, the lightning came down on the school field and bounced back up. And I don't know whether it's possible for that to happen, but that's how I remember it. And I uh, do occasionally get together with uh, school friends of that time. And you know, when, we, when we reminisce, um, we do, um, it's one of, the, you know, one of the days we remember, remember that day. Um, and they remember the sky going black. And they remember the lightning bouncing off the field. But they don't remember what for me was the most significant part of that moment. Because what our teacher did, and we could hear these the howls and screams from the rest of the school, our teacher pulled us together in the class and told us a ghost story. <laughs> now for me, I was completely mesmerized by this. And my memory of that day in 1968 is the story yeah, everything else is fantastic, and I haven't say, but it's the story is the uh, is the memory, and uh, you know that's the, the power of stories. You know that's why the Bible is full of stories. Stories are, are, are a great power, and uh, and certainly when I was teaching and planning a lesson or planning an assembly, I always ask myself, you know, what's the st what what is the story here? Because I think that's what uh, people remember um, most of all. Um, that history teacher inspired me. And I was fortunate to have other teachers who inspired me. I had one man who taught me Latin, French, geography, and history. Um, I'm not going to mention his name, but if you read the Northern Cross, um, 
I think he has the record for the most letters in the Northern Cross, and he's got one in this month's uh, edition as well, and John Billy's at the back, so he'll know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, um, uh, and he, he, he had a, a, a significant influence in my, in, in my life. Um, we used to have a Latin vocabulary test every week, for example, and he was a keen football fan, and he would go to, to uh, matches, Sunday in particular, bring the programme, and the prize for the, um, for the top mark in the vocabulary test was, was Saturday's programme. Well, that was something worth having for me. I collected programmes and read them from cover to cover. So, weekends, I learned and I revised for a Latin test, and invariably, I got the top mark. Wasn't the cleverest in the class by any means, but I wanted uh, that programme. Um, and the end of year prize uh, was that he took three of us to Old Trafford, to see uh, um, Manchester United play um, Sunderland in the last game of the season, 1968. Some of you might remember it was uh, it was uh, uh, the, the season was under knife edge. As it happens, Sunderland beat Manchester United, uh, and that meant that Manchester City were champions that year because they were playing at uh, Newcastle, and you know it, 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 a big a big thing um, uh, uh, for me, and, and something that I will be grateful. That, uh, that um, somebody um, you know, put themselves out um, in, in that way. I um, don't know if you're aware, but nationally and in Hartlepool, there is an issue uh, about the achievement of boys. Boys um, uh, don't do as well as girls. Okay, when I started here in 1977, the, it was the other way around. Girls were underachieving, and we said, "What are we going to do about these girls?" Now we are education saying, "What are we going to do about these boys and the people in here who are who are leading the authorities sort of uh, um, challenge on this?" And you know, uh, you know, some of the, th the key things identified are well, find boys, find something they're interested in, find them something that's competitive, and then find something that's rewarding that they'll value. Well, you know. I was fortunate to have somebody who, who found that out in 1968, and it worked for me. And uh, yeah, and, and I'll be forever um, grateful for that. So I was looking to be taught by some inspirational teachers. In the interests of uh, balance, I would also record that I was taught by some people who should never have been allowed within 100 miles of a classroom. Um, and I could go on, but I'm not, but I'll give you one example. <laughs> music, music. Um, music lessons, uh, uh, in those times, three years, we had three years of music lessons. Music lesson consisted of uh, a record player with an LP, I'm not sure we call them LPs, in those that are 45 or whatever, put, put on the disc, and then we had the score, the music score, and we had to follow that. That was a music lesson. Um, Nobody taught me how to was how to read music, um, so how, you know how how do you, how do you do that? Uh, well, what I obviously did was I sat behind somebody who, who knew what they were doing and I followed them. And you know, they were on the top line, I was on the top line, and, and so forth. Um, unfortunately, we might have been on the same line, but we weren't on the same page. <laughs> so if you if you were out of place, you got beaten, and I mean beaten. You know, I'm not joking. You, you got uh, absolute knuckles to the back of your head, and I can't listen to P. Gint, Sweet, or Heine Klein and Nine Nacht music, you know, because I remember the uh, the kind of the brutality I got because I was on the wrong page and I couldn't and I couldn't do it. And you know, you might say that's 50 years ago, Mike. You should have got all that by now. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't. I accept that. Um, fortunately, that kind of savagery and now, and that's. I use that word, you know, thought about what, what word I'm going to use, and that's the word I use, was rare. But what was common was um, a culture of low expectations. Theoretically, the boys who you saw in that photograph, theoretically, we were the brightest and most able boys from the Catholic schools of Newton Acre, Chilton, Furry Hill, Spenny Moor, Barnard Castle, and Norton. That's where that's where we came from. Um, and my overriding feeling is nobody expected us to do very well, uh, and so it proved. Um, 
and we do have uh, school reunions and gatherings and the overall uh, uh, impression is one of disappointment and, uh, and underachievement when we came to leave school. Um, and we sometimes hear calls for a return to single sex grammar schools and I accept my experience is not the same as everybody else's but that's my experience and and any return to a school like that would be, in my view, a completely retrograde um, step. I was one of the lucky ones I made at university, uh, and I went to Hull University. After that, I went to uh, Newcastle University to do my PGCE. And whilst I was there, I got a letter, and that's a sign of the times, a letter from Bob Lewis, who was head of English uh, here at the time, saying there's a, there's a history job in English Mars, why don't you apply for it? Um, um, and I did, and I was interviewed by um, Father Bell, and, uh, and I was appointed in September 1977. Uh, my first classroom uh, was in what is now the White House, uh, and the first class I ever taught in is now the gents' toilet in the, uh, <laughs> in, in, in the White House. I also taught in Woodlands, uh, um, uh, and my classroom was, if you look at that building, the right hand, the big, big bay window on the right hand side, uh, that was my classroom there, and uh, it's a side view of what, uh, what the, the school at that time um, looked like. John Bell, after whom this lecture is, is, is named, um, he had many gifts, uh, he, after, you know, years after that interview he told me that I was the best appointment he'd ever made. I discovered later on he told everybody that. <laughs> but he had a gift for making you feel good about yourself and he was passionate about English matters and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, any, anything to do with anybody, any teacher, any student about English matters, he would praise them to the, to the heavens. He was very erudite and fond of uh, Latin quotations. And I, one thing that impressed me, was I remember being with him, coming into this hall, was an exam one, uh, and he could come in to any exam, look at any examination paper, whatever the subject, and have a sensible discussion with that class teacher about that paper. And he could tell whether it was a good paper or not or whatever. And his breadth of, uh, of, of knowledge was, was amazing. And, and uh, I, you know, I've never found that in any other uh, teacher that uh, um, uh, I've, ever, I've ever come across. He was, of course, first and foremost a teacher. Um, uh, and in this day and age when um, you know, the teacher profession has is, is improved immeasurably and one of the reasons is because teachers get to watch what the teachers teach and teachers teach and then others come in and offer criticism. John Bell was no good at, uh, at sitting in on a lesson because he, he, he always felt he urged to take over and in one particular um, lesson of mine uh, he, he came in and he sat at the back and he was writing furiously and I thought what on earth is he finding all this to write about? Then halfway through the lesson, he got up and he said, right, Michael, you go and sit at the back, and he took over. And he, taught, and he then said, right, students, he said, you don't know how lucky you are to be an English smartest. You don't know how lucky you are to uh, have a wonderful teacher like Mr. Lee. He said, and in fact, he's so wonderful, I've written a poem about him. Uh, and he then began to recite the poem, and then he got the students to repeat the poem and to learn the poem. And the last two lines of the poem, and I, saw, I told some of you about this before, the last two lines of the poem were this. Mr. Lee is tall and strong. <laughs> we will love him all life long. Now, why do I remember that? Well, it's because that class, and in those days, the, the class stayed where they were, and it was the teacher that moved. Every time I opened the door to go in to teach them a lesson, they would say, Mr. Lee is tall and strong. We will love him all life long. Um, so thank you, Father Bell, uh, for that. Um, John Bell was replaced as, as head teacher in, uh, in 1980 by David Relton, see you tonight, uh, and I remember David's uh, first ever staff meeting in this room, and it was electrifying. Um, David set out his agenda as, uh, uh, as to where he was going to take the school, hugely ambitious uh, agenda I might add, and I remember walking out of this room with Jack Grady, who some of you will remember, and Jack said, to me, what do you think of that? I said, well, I think we're in for a bumpy ride. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was the case. David's you know, difficult to encapsulate everything, but he said, but in essence, uh, David was going to uh, um, 
establish, confirm, improve the, uh, the status of the school, not just in Hartlepool, not just in the diocese, but nationally. And, you know, and so, so proved by the time David, 15 years uh, uh, said, English Martyrs did have a national reputation as a, as a, a centre of excellence. Um, 15 years after that, Joe Hughes uh, came his head, and I also remember Joe's first um, uh, staff meeting, uh, and he too had an, had an agenda, uh, and it was about the exam results. And he gave us a target, and, and the target was at that time, he said, 50% uh, of students will leave the school with at least five good GCEs. Right, now we were nowhere near that at the time, nobody was. We, we, thought, we can't do that, you know, how, how do we do that? Within a couple of years we did it. And so we came back in that September when, when we got all 50%, and Joe started the staff meeting, I said, well done everybody, we did it, well done. And that feeling of euphoria lasted about two minutes because he then said, right, your next target is now 60%. So, you know, another hugely ambitious target. How on earth are we, uh, are we going to reach that? And it was, you know, as teachers you felt uncomfortable because, you, you know, you'd done pretty, you'd been asked what, you'd done what was asked of you and now you were being asked to do even more. And it was, it was, it was tough. Um, but interesting, Remember, I, 30 years earlier, I'm talking about a culture of low expectations. 30 years later, the server was turned completely, and, uh, and, and now that doesn't exist, and we've got students in the room tonight, they've got, they've got targets for every subject they do. I don't think there's any student who will say, my targets are pretty low, you know. They've all got high targets, high expectations, um, and that's a significant thing that has happened to schools um, in the last 50 years. Uh, also, um, and Joe, right there, was head teacher for 15 years, and lo and behold, yeah, we, we, we hit that 60%, and we surpassed it by a margin before, before the time that um, Joe left. In Joe's first year here, we had our first Ofsted inspection, um, and Ofsted then was a, was a different beast. The, the report at the time said this. Yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd accept that, wouldn't you? What parent wouldn't want to send their child to a school where Ofsted, independent, had said that about them, yeah? And Ofsted inspectors in those days uh, wrote in poetry, Darren, was he that? Uh, yeah, and uh, it's different now. And in that same report also talked about a maths lesson taught by Michael Coy, Coyle that talked about students with, uh, uh, observing with awe and wonder. That was a maths lesson, I mean, you know, and, and that's, that's a report written in, 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 in poetry. Um, so I've said, without a doubt, one of the, in, in my 30 years of English matters, one of the most significant factors, with, 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 without a doubt. Um, and whilst I have many reservations about the way Ofsted operates, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that the existence of Obstead, and I, I, I attach to that the publication of, of examination results and the league tables, I don't think there's any doubt that schools have improved as a result of that. And they've, they've improved because we're all accountable now. And the reason why, when I was at secondary school, a lot of people just drifted away, didn't achieve what, what, they, what they should have done, was nobody was accountable. Nobody found out what anybody else did. Nobody found out anyone else was. Nobody was accountable. People just accepted it, and that's what it is. Now, the accountability culture is tough. There's some unpleasant aspects of it, about it and I'm uneasy about some, sometimes, sometimes the league tables and uneasy about Ofsted, but on balance, uh, they've been good um, for schools. Um, and league tables, huge reservations about, but they're a fact of life, they're here. So if they're here, you know, let's just make sure we, we remain top of them. Uh, another big change in those 38 years has been the relative decline of local authority compared with the, um, the, the increasing powers of the Secretary of State. And when I started here in September 77, the Secretary of State was Shirley, for education was Shirley Williams, and it, it currently when I left is Nicky Morgan. Strangely enough, a month ago, I met both of them. 
and I had lunch with both of them actually. Um, and uh, and I, because I started to think about this, I actually knew this, and I saw, I said, here's an interesting little thing for you. And uh, they were fascinated by that, you know, the, 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 the connection. In fact, they were so fascinated, I thought that they would have been here tonight, but they were, <laughs> well, obviously they haven't made it. Um, um, and if you want to know the, uh, the story about that, then you need to get this month's Northern Cross. Okay. How am I doing, John? I'm okay, is that? Two, two references so far, yeah. Okay. Fine. Um, They're all outside. <laughs> there you go. Um, but the reason I, uh, uh, I, I make reference to Secretaries of State is this. The, in my 38 years of uh, uh, English Marks, there have been 18 different uh, Secretaries of State. Basically, the last about two years, okay? And that's an issue because if you're Secretary of State, you want to make your mark, you want to do something. But you, you know, if you've got two years, you haven't got much time to do it. And that without a shadow of doubt, I think there's been initiative overload of... Uh, 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 the schools have, have had to cope with constant change and as we speak now schools are struggling with changes in the rules about examinations changes in syllabuses uh, and changes in accountability measures yet another wave of change that people have got to cope with and I can predict with some certainty that some people will understand those changes in accountability measures but there will all be people who are working within schools Parents and employers, who are the ones that really matter, who won't have a clue what they're all about. Um, and that's partly because we've got this constant change that, that we're, uh, we're having to deal with. The world has, uh, has changed, of course, uh, in, in, in other ways, in other ways, uh, dramatically, um, since 1977. You know, computers, social networking, the internet, were the stuff of, uh, of science fiction. You know, uh, I remember our first ever photocopier, people stood around it in amazement. I remember the first ever computer, people stood around that in, in amazement too. You know, we didn't have phone, uh, mobile phones, we didn't have laptops, and a tablet was something you took when you weren't feeling very well. Um, and at that time, very few people could afford a home computer. You didn't have them at home, but we had some at school, uh, and you wanted, to, you wanted to work on computers and learn how they worked and get, and get some work done and so forth. So, you know, people were allowed to take them, take them home on a weekend and on a holiday and do something, do something with them. Uh, there were bulky things, you know, it took you three, or if you had a printer, four journeys to the car to, uh, to, to, to put them in. But there weren't enough for everybody to go around, so we, so you did, you did arrangements with members of staff, and somebody would have it for the first half of the holidays, somebody would have it for the second half of the holidays, and so forth. Um, I had one such agreement with a man called Tom Quinn, who was, uh, had a sixth form, um, at, at the time, and he was going to have it for the first part of the summer of the days, and I'd have it for the second half. Second half of the holidays came, and there was no computer, so I rang him up and said, Tom, you know, where, where's the computer, please? I've you know, got work to do. He said, oh, sorry, he said, uh, we've just got back from Ikea. Well, I didn't know what Ikea was, I've never heard of it before. So I assumed it was a Greek island, because that's what it sounds like. So, I said, oh, so, I'm sorry to bother you, Tom. I said, well, if you just got back from Ikea, you'll clearly need a few days to uh, <laughs> sort yourselves out, you know. I said, did you have a good time at Ikea? <laughs> he said, yeah. I said, and I said uh, what was the weather like? <laughs> and how on earth he kept safe where he said, well, it was all right, it rained on the way back. <laughs> so I said, uh, so, so, well, obviously, I'm going to leave it to it. I'll leave you a few days. You need to sort of recover from the journey. Uh, and uh, I'll get back with you uh, in a few days, Tom. All right, fine. I put the phone on. I said, oh, I feel, I said, Hillary, I feel bad. You know, they just got back from holidays and I'm asking them about this computer. I said, oh, where have you been? I said, I just said, they've been to a Greek island and I've never heard of it before. I said, the place got called Ikea. I said, I don't think they've been to a furniture factory at the Metro Centre. <laughs> So, time moved on and uh, people had got their own computers and so forth. I went to Ikea and uh, <laughs> had the uh, reindeer meatballs and things like that. Um, but the world, you know, schools and the world has changed in other ways too. You know, if in 1977 uh, we'd done a list of uh, st students who came from any other countries other than, 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 than England, it would have been a very small list. This is the list as of today. Uh, 
um, 27 different countries students in English matters at the moment. So 25 different countries speaking 27 different languages other than England. And that's not including the home countries of England, Scotland and Wales and so forth. Um, the world has changed and it's not going to go back to the way it was uh, before. Um, and I think we can be um, immensely proud of the, um, the work that the people in the school do in, uh, in greeting those students. Um, as an illustration, the top performing uh, student in 2014, uh, this is at A level, was a boy who arrived in year nine uh, at, with the ability to speak two words in English. And you know, five years later, he was our top performing student. You know, and that's because of the efforts that people put in, in, in with him when he arrived. Then they worked with him in lessons um, and so forth. And I think that we can be proud of the fact that uh, of, of all the secondary schools in Hartlepool, we have the uh, um, the biggest makeup of, uh, of ethnic minority students, as indeed do many of our uh, primary schools, uh, of score, of course. And I think we should be proud of the f of the fact that. Um, Teachers uh, and other members of staff provide opportunities uh, uh, for students to, to be part of, of the bigger world. Um, you know, in, when I was head teacher for, for the last five years, we quite often had ten foreign trips um, abroad, um, you know, providing opportunities um, for people. And I well remember the time when Linda Ward came to me and said, I want to take students to a country where there is no electricity, there's very little running water, and there's no medical facilities to speak of. What do you think? You know, and that was the beginning of our link with the Gambia, and students have just come back from, I think, the eighth, uh, eighth trip to, to the Gambia. I've been fortunate enough to be four times, uh, and for me, and for anybody that's been, that was a life-changing experience. And, you know, and I take my hat off to anybody that um, takes the risk, and it is a risk to take um, um, students anywhere, but it's, it's the, 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 the impact and the benefits for our students are uh, absolutely um, enormous. Because there is a danger that in Hartlepool we can be introspective, and people sometimes say that about uh, Hartlepool. It is a close-knit community, and if we're not careful, we can look in on ourselves. We have to continue to look outward. Um, and we have to respond to a changing world. That's why um, I have a, a concern about a decision taken recently in GCSE RA students have to study two religions and uh, Christianity is, is obvious, is, is fairly obvious. But the, the bishops of England and Wales have, have decided that we will that we'll study, uh, that schools in, in, in England and Wales will study uh, Judaism as the second religion rather than Islam. Now, there are good reasons for that and there are good theological reasons for that. But I think there is a danger that that doesn't quite reflect the world that we're, uh, that we're living in. And I hope that's a decision that we don't um, come to rule. Catholic schools, we have, we have got some uh, um, challenges uh, ahead. Um, I'll use as an example, we, we, for the last few years we did have a battle ultimately lost, as did as many schools, uh, to retain free school transport um, to, the, to, to, um, to the school. Um, and the decision to end that was basically uh, ripping up an agreement that had been made in 1944. And that's going to have a profound uh, impact upon some um, secondary schools. A big issue uh, for Catholic schools at the moment, all schools, but Catholic schools in particular, is recruitment of, of teachers. Um, if I say that currently more teachers are leaving the profession than are being trained, we know we've got a problem. Secondly, the problem is biggest in coastal towns. Right? Why? Well, if you think of the geography, it, pe people cannot come in from the east traveling from the east to, to come here, unless you might cranny, I suppose, is the only exception I can think of uh, as to that. And then a third factor is, uh, currently the position is that senior positions have to be held by practicing Catholics. That uh, is a disincentive, a disincentive, I think, on some people, for some people applying to, um, to schools. Um, and I, you know, I think we have to wonder about the message it sends out to, uh, uh, colleagues who, who devote their lives to teaching in Catholic school, but we say, yeah, we great, thank you much for everything you do, but actually we don't, we, we, we don't recognise that you can hold that particular position in a, in a, in a school. In this, the, the Catholic Church has been very slow to, uh, to face up to um, 
this is the by the way, this is the joy use section by the way, in case you're wondering why I'm talking about this, but he's not here. Uh, uh, very slow to address the issue of uh, of, uh, of a shortage of priests, and you know, and you know, closing parishes isn't isn't the, the answer. I think we need something more imaginative than that. And I think in just the same way, we have to wake up to the issue of recruitment in Catholic schools. Uh, and I think that's something that, uh, that you know, need, needs addressing uh, soon. What I've been describing here in, in the last 50 years is, is something, is a revolution in, in, in schools. And uh, I, I don't think Catholic schools are in imminent danger. Uh, Catholic schools are thriving, to, to be honest. Uh, but we can't be complacent about what the next 50 um, years holds. When I look back over my time in English Mars, it's the special occasions that, um, that stand out. Fortune for the Gambia, for example. Uh, the 25th, the 40th uh, anniversaries. It's the 50th in seven years' time, by the way. I'm just putting that out there. John Bell lectures, awards nights, music events, sporting triumph, retreats, including the first ever um, staff retreat run entirely by students, and we're claiming that one as a world record, by the way. Uh, public speaking competitions, including students winning national uh, competitions uh, for that. The art exhibitions, strictly come, come dancing competitions. That's Marie Chapman and, and Joe Hughes in the top right hand corner there, by the way. Um, and, you know, I know it's World Book Day today, and uh, we, we, well, I, I, I suspect we've had some people dressed up today, but I, I do think, as a teacher, I got asked to dress up an awful lot. Um, <laughs> I don't know why that was. This is the 70th anniversary of VE Day. I won't embarrass any of my colleagues by, um, on that day, um, some people, you know, I think it's fairly obvious who I'm supposed to be, spent the day, the day dressed as, uh, as Winston Churchill, and some people, not in jest, said, why are you dressed as uh, Charlie Chaplin? <laughs> Not Charlie Chaplin, or Stan Laurel. <laughs> what day is it today? You know, uh, if you want to know the story, that was a, a year eleven retreat at the youth village. If you want to know the story about that one, then uh, you uh, really need to see Anne Marie, I think. Um, so, as well as those highlights and those great uh, fun events, of course, uh, there have been some tragedies and uh, the deaths of students, of course. Uh, 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 moments that, uh, that, that impact upon us all um, and, and test us all and, uh, and we've had recent uh, experience of that but you know quite a few deaths of students in school going back over the years um, but they did provide us with an opportunity to find out we, what we were made of and, and, and what we, you know, who we were um, vivid memories of, uh, of the two occasions when 1,500 students lined the route of Catcote Road for the funeral cortege of, first of all, Canon John Bell, and then the, ne the next one was Michael Carr. And I just think it's an interesting kind of juxtaposition. We've done that for two people. One was for the head teacher, and one was for the caretaker. And, you know, and I think that says something about us as, um, as a community, um, and very, very vivid memories of, of those uh, events. More than anything, I'll remember, um, I'll remember the students. Um, and I'll be forever grateful that I found a career, and it was partly by luck I found a career that uh, was fulfilling and enjoyable. And uh, the, one of the great satisfactions of the job is when a student comes back to you, comes back and says, thank you very much for all that you've done for me. And that happened to me towards the end of last year when a student got in touch and said, I want to wish you well in your retirement, Mr. Mer Mr. Lee. Thank you for everything you've done for me. Um, you taught me something that uh, I've remembered for the rest of my life. And you feel great about yourself. And he should have stopped there. <laughs> uh, he, said, yeah, he said, what you taught me was, he said, you taught me how to spell diarrhea. <laughs> Julie Hill's possibly the only person in the room who knows where this one is going, but we taught uh, GCSE social and economic history, we taught about the cholera epidemic. One of the symptoms of, of diarrhea, of cholera rather, was you got diarrhea. So if you're going to write about it, you're going to spell it correctly, and spelling, punctuation, grammar, always a big thing for me. 
so I taught my students how to spell diarrhea by use of a, a mnemonic, and um, uh, you know, when, you know, I'm sure you know what a mnemonic is, but it's a sentence where uh, uh, the, fir the first letter of each word, so you remember the sentence, and the first letter of each word spells out uh, the word in di diarrhea, a very difficult one to spell. So the mnemonic is this, listen carefully, uh, dashing in a rush, running hard, or else accident. <laughs> right? So are we going to do this together? <laughs> so the students at the back will join me in this one. After three, one, two, three. Dashing in a rush, running hard, or else accident. And you remember that. And the first letter is black, and you can spell diarrhea for the rest of your life. And this, well, it was a young man by the time he got in touch with me. He said, you'd be amazed how many times that comes up in crosswords. <laughs> so, and I'd be, students at the back, I'd be grateful when you go home tonight and your mum and dad's ask you, what did Mr. Lee talk about? You can miss that last bit out. <laughs> if, you, if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to finish now by uh, going back to my great-grandfather, Michael. Uh, uh, when he, he came uh, to the northeast for, from Ireland, there was no Catholic uh, school and there was no Catholic church. Um, so they, they were paid fortnightly. So he and his fellow miners, they would give whatever they could to a, to a building fund, um, um, obviously for a building. And what did they build? They didn't build a church, they built a school. And that is a, is a measure think of the value put in education by people who couldn't read and write and who had virtually um, uh, nothing. You know, first we'll build a school and then we'll worry about the church afterwards. Um, and that's it's their sacrifice that means we have schools, Catholic schools, schools like this uh, um, at this day. And if they hadn't been prepared to make those sacrifices, we wouldn't be here today. And I think that legacy is a legacy that's been bequeathed to every one of us um, in this room. And it's a legacy which um, we should never forget. I think it's a legacy that we should be prepared to fight for if the need arises. And I think it's a legacy of which we can all be um, immensely proud. Thank you very much.